Okay, so it's great to see a bunch of you dialing in from different places around the states and around the world. Hello and welcome to our webinar. So this webinar is how to boost performance through well-being, and it's presented to you by Unmind and Culture M. So when it comes to employee well-being and business performance, they shouldn't be seen as these competing objectives that you need to trade off against each other. In fact, they are, or they should be seen as interdependent and synergistic pursuits, if indeed they're approached in the right way. And the truth is, and this message that we strongly believe in, is that helping your people to flourish at work is the single best way to nurture a high performance culture. But this will not happen by accident. It needs to be intentional and it needs to be a full commitment. So it's, I mean, let's face it, it it's a challenging undertaking, especially in the increasingly complex and demanding world of work, which is why you need a strategy that is grounded in clinical, organizational, and positive psychology to get there. And that's what we are here today to show you how to do. And we have the right people on the call to share this insight with you. So my name is Steve Peralta. I'm the co-founder and chief wellbeing officer at Unmind. And joining me today and bringing their valuable expertise and their experience to this topic is Dr. Katie Adesico, who is an applied positive psychologist at Unmind, and Simone Duarte, a senior people scientist. So Katie and Simone, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. And I think I asked Katie before the call to tell me how to pronounce her surname, and I think I still got it wrong. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so <laughs> <worry>. <laughs> okay, and thank you to all of you on the call who have taken this hour out of your day to join us for this, what I think is a really important conversation and a really relevant conversation in today's world. So if you have any questions as this conversation progresses, please do pop them in the Q&A box and we will leave some time to answer a few of them towards the end. But let's get into the conversation. <clears throat> so to, to kick things off, I just wanted to share a few statistics that just, I guess, help to set the scene somewhat. It's important to see where things are at right now. So according to Deloitte, 43% of employees report always being exhausted at work. 42% of employees report always feeling stressed at work, and 90% of employees feel that their work, work life is getting worse. Now, the business impact of this, which is relevant to our conversation today, is that $1 trillion worth of productivity is lost per year across the globe due to poor mental health at work, and 12 billion days are lost to absenteeism caused by poor mental health. So there are obviously a range of multifactorial causes involved here. And some of these factors are outside of our control. You know, there's things like the pandemic, the impact of that, the economic instability that we've been faced with, cost of living crisis. But I would argue that there are also causes or factors that are inside of our control. And from my perspective, these are like our beliefs about work, how we are choosing to work. And if you're a leader, how you're choosing to show up as a leader. We know that leaders and managers play a really important role in the well-being of their organization. And I think this second group of causes, those factors inside of our control, have something to do with how we think about the relationship between pursuing results and prioritizing well-being. And so when we look at the the rising rates of burnout, so we look at the mental health problems in the workplace, and when we consider some of the statistics that I've just shared, it might suggest that for some organizations, pursuing achievement and results on the one hand, and prioritizing employee well-being are mutually exclusive things. I think there might be a belief that these things need to be traded off against one another. So Simone and Katie, I would love to, at the outset, hear your thoughts on this. Are these two things mutually exclusive? Um, let's start with Simone. What are your thoughts on this? Steve, I think that's a really interesting concept that they are mutually exclusive. Um, I would encourage organizations to think about how they're not mutually exclusive, given one, all the stats that you have obviously just mentioned. Um, and we also know from research that we have that they actually aren't, meaning that when employee well-being um, is championed, um, it can enhance company performance. In fact, there have been several studies that have found this. Um, so obviously the groundwork has been laid. 
In addition, I've been reading some great articles as of late. One that really comes to mind and resonated with me was an HBR article um, that indicated that employers that have comprehensive well-being strategies and culture positively impacted organizations' performance. Um, to illustrate this point um, even further, using a real company, the article highlighted the efforts and the effectiveness of the wellness program at Johnson & Johnson. Over the past decade, that company has saved over $250 million on healthcare costs um, for their employees. And this not only impacts the bottom line for the organization, but it also helps to create an environment where employees um, can thrive in a social, mental, and um, physical from a physical perspective. This can lead to less attrition and more engaged employees, which directly impact the, impacts an organization's performance. So I would encourage organizations and their leaders, more importantly, to think about what they're trading off if they select to focus more on performance over the well-being of their employees. I think that I would suggest to organizations to think about how they're integrating um, well-being into their culture versus prioritizing it over profit. And I know we'll be talking about some practical tips um, later in this conversation to really help get that started. Definitely. Thank you, Simone. Yeah, as you say, there's, there is a lot of compelling research and evidence and science out there. And perhaps we can speak some of that more as we progress in this conversation. But um, from my perspective, you can't have one without the other. And I wanted to just, when I think of this, and this might just be language used, <clears throat> I think it's, it's a case of results versus well-being. And if you prioritize both of those, high performance is the outcome. <clears throat> That's the way that I tend to think about it. I think it can be useful to have these kinds of um, frameworks in mind. Katie, what are your thoughts? Uh, my, guess is, my guess is that you agree, but agree with Simone, but let, let's hear from you. Yeah, I uh, agree with both of you, with wonderful what you both said, actually. Um, I do think that it is important to acknowledge um, that finding the right balance between achieving results and prioritizing employee well being can be challenging. Um, but it is absolutely only through a holistic approach, you know, recognizing that employee well-being and organizational success are actually interdependent, that we are more likely that way to create a positive work environment that kind of fosters productivity, innovation, and also long-term success. So rather than viewing achievement and employee well-being as mutually exclusive, definitely, like you and Simone already said, it's about, you know, organizations should really strive to integrate both by fostering a supportive culture, implementing policies that prioritize well-being and actually valuing employee input as well. So essentially cultivating a psychologically safe environment as well. So that way organizations can create a very harmonious balance uh, that promotes both the individual but also organizational growth. Yeah, as you were saying that, Katie, I, I, I use this analogy quite a lot. I think one of the underlying factors for perhaps pursuing results at the expense of people is that some of us perceive the organization as a machine with like inputs and outputs, when in fact it's a, an ecosystem made up of human beings with, with brains and physiologies. And if those brains and physiologies are healthy, then they form better, right? And when they're not, they don't. So like, it, again, it's a, a bit of a switch in terms of how, how our paradigm and how we perceive things can make quite a difference. On, on that note, you both shared some reference to research, and Simone, you mentioned some specific research. Do you have any other compelling science or data to back up why, rather than sacrificing well-being to pursue or achieve business objectives, we should instead embrace it as an integral part of a successful organization, like you say, Katie? So Katie, maybe, or whoever, whoever has, whoever would like to go first. Yeah, I mean, um, I think you know thinking about that question I really think if we were to ask everybody on the call to recall any kind of past achievements I'm almost certain that each person would say the biggest ones were when they were at their best because they also felt well and that's very much in line with the growing amount of research that supports this notion that prioritizing employee well-being is not only beneficial for individuals but also crucial for the success of the organization and there is so, you know, if I think about it, it's very difficult to se select any, especially because of my specialisms as well. But I think overall, there are so many papers that have the same conf confirmatory results that 
when employees have high levels of well-being, they're more productive, they have higher job satisfaction, they demonstrate better job performance, they're more likely to engage in proactive workplace behaviour, they go above and beyond their job requirements often. And those employees are also likely to be emotionally connected to their work, resulting in higher levels of customer satisfaction or profitability and overall organisational success. Um, I mean, the World Health Organization, for example, they report that good mental health in the workplace is essential and it's actually associated with increased productivity and economic gains. And that alone makes it, again, a very valuable investment, right, for organizations. Um, and it comes back to also high job satisfaction, work engagement, that both are components of well-being. So those are associated with lower intentions to quit, decreased turnover, um, and I guess if, in, on the flip side, if you look at employees with poor well-being, they're more likely to have higher rates of absenteeism and turnover, you know, and that leads ultimately to increased costs for the organization. So um, and more and more research is actually coming out, on, especially in Australia, uh, on psychological safe climates at work and reducing the psychosocial hazards very much highlights that correlation with better mental health and well-being as well. So. I think investing in that organizations can create a thriving and sustainable workforce. Thank you. Long run. Yeah. Simone, your thoughts? Katie, I think that you've touched on so many great points. Um, and I definitely um in imbibing with some of the things that you're saying. I would also like to add that we know that well-being can affect everything from employee engagement to retention. At Culture Amp, I have the privilege of working with our enterprise customers. And so looking across all of our book of business and gathering that data, we at Culture Amp have actually compared employee um, survey responses to the statement, I rarely feel overstressed by my work with the engagement data. And unsurprisingly aligned with a lot of the research that's already out there, we found that um, employees who uh, marked that item, I am rarely overstressed as more favorable. They were actually 89.5% um, engaged. Um, those who were feeling overstressed, so who rated that item um, unfavorably, they were only um, about 49% engaged. So you can start to see that uh, obviously burnout and well being does impact employee engagement. Moreover, when we started to compare the employees' responses to feeling overstressed compared to attrition data, we started to see that employees who felt overstressed were more likely to leave the company within the next 12 years, 12 months, excuse me. Um, and so what this highlights particularly for me is that um, we know that if employees leave, it has impacts to both the macro and micro um, impacts on the organization. So everything from team cohesion to the cost of the organ uh, to the cost to the organization to rehire um, employee, Katie, to your point, um, it's going to cost more if you have to backfill a position. We know that from the Society for Human Resource Management that the average cost of a company to rehire a uh, employee is about six to nine months of the employee's salary. Um, so when you start to really think about if you're constantly having attrition and you're constantly having people turn over because they are burnt out or their well-being is not being put at the forefront, you're looking at millions of dollars for your organization and a loss of continuity of information potentially. So overall, in prioritizing employee well-being, it helps both the organization and employees win. Organizations get employees who are more engaged, um, which can lead to more profits and decrease in spending on employee health care costs, as well as employees get to experience less psychological and physiolo physiological strains um, through interventions that are made available by their organization. Yeah, um, it, it's just really compelling the matter which way you look at it. I think the irony is the, the reason why well-being is sacrificed um, actually ends up not being fulfilled. It's like the, it ends up to counterproductive outcomes. You know, business performance is the reason why well-being is sacrificed. But as you have already shared here, it leads to the opposite effect that, that we are trying to achieve, right? You know, which is negative impact on business. I think a good reference point, I don't know if you look at the, the Fortune 100, like best companies to work for, and those are rated based on employee well-being on work-life balance on trust and leadership and the like things that we are I guess speaking about today all of those organizations outperform other organizations they outperform the market and so I mean it's just it's compelling no matter which way you look at it and I came across I think it's the largest meta-analysis of its kind it involved 230 organizations 2 million employees and again the results are conclusive that well-being was a causal driver of 
increased productivity and performance. So not just a relationship, but like a causal driver of, which I think is as compelling as it gets, right? Um, so, you know, we know that then the research, the science, the data presents a compelling argument for well-being in the workplace. But let's say we understand this and take this on board. It can be difficult sometimes knowing where to start. So, Simone, I'm going to ask you, first of all, how can organizations go about prioritizing and promoting mental health and well-being in their organization? So, what are some of the key resources available to them? And this might include things like technology. It might include or it should include their own people. And, and how can the resources available to organizations best be leveraged? Sure. I, I think that not only can it be complicated, I think it can be a little overwhelming, like, right? So it's like, where do you where do you even start? And for me, whenever I start to think about where to start, I'm auto automatically going to go with data. Um, we can't start putting together um, interventions without data. The best way to do that is through surveying. Um, and so you're gathering what's going well in your organization, you're gathering areas of improvement, and most importantly, you're gathering what's most important to your employees because we know well-being needs can definitely vary from organization to organization and even employee to employee. Um, leveraging organizations like Coltramp can definitely be helpful um, in gathering that real-time data. It helps you to customize again and scope your well-being initiatives. Um, after the gap, after the data is gathered, it's then really important for organizations to think about how to actually build that into their organization's identity. So we've been kind of talking about this a little bit already, but making sure that you are putting that at the forefront and it's not something that just kind of sits in the back of your HR department or in some corner of your organization, but really thinking about how you bake that into your business priorities. What are the impacts on your EVP and your employee experience? After the step strategy is set, I think it's also important to get buy-in and think about enablement. Um, and this is where leaders of all levels from the C-suite to managers um, is really critical. So making sure that you're enabling them to show up for their employees to help support their well-being. Um, oftentimes we know that leaders serve as role models within organizations. So making sure that they are also too modeling those behaviors that are critical to support employee well-being. Um, this is, again, also too where well-being champions can definitely be helpful. Um, finally, it's not enough to talk just about well-being. It's really also important to fund and leverage change management to ensure that efforts do not fail. This is where organizations want to think about accessibility, communications, and potential partnerships that could be used to bring their strategy to life. Um, I think that this is probably the piece where organizations get it a little bit wrong or it can be a little bit um, something of a pain point is around that idea of funding and making sure that you do have a backing to do that. I would also encourage organizations to be gentle with themselves when they embark on their wellness journey, well, with any journey really, but specifically with well-being journeys. Like all organizational changes, things take time. So you wanna make sure that you're mapping out your plan, you have accountability, and you know that the plan, uh, that it will take uh, practice and uh, planning to get this right. Yeah, I think that that last point is so important. There's no perfect strategy here and perfect approach and it'll be different for every organization. But the thing that you mentioned right at the outset, data, that's what helps you to track the effectiveness of your strategy. It helps you to, to learn, adapt, pivot, et cetera. Um, it's, it's supremely important. And to, to keep a pulse check on your organization and know how they are doing and get feedback from them on your strategy, it's just, it's this constantly sort of self-reinforcing thing. You learn, you adapt, you learn, you adapt. I think that, that's really powerful and, and interesting insight that you shared there, Simone. Uh, Katie, you've got something to add there. <laughs> you can see from a face. I just really wanted to reiterate that point from a psychological perspective as well, because it's so important to acknowledge that this is a process and that we are talking about human beings here. And, you know, <laughs> There are and will always be individual differences. We all have different circumstances and organizations have different aims and ways of working. So it's very important to keep that in mind and make available knowledge and tools applicable to your own setting and acknowledge that like anything in life, change takes time and adjustment. So it is a process worthwhile, but yeah, just acknowledging that it's a process, very important. That's great, thank you. You mentioned they're being gentle with Ourselves. I think it's important to be dealing with ourselves and each other when it comes to this, right? It's, yeah. it's difficult stuff, but if we're committed to it, then we can Absolutely. learn it the wrong way, for sure. 
So, look, you just mentioned that we're dealing with human beings here, Katie, and every single human being, every single person has a role to play in creating mentally healthy organizations. But I think it's important to, to call out, or at least to say that that leadership does have an outsized influence. We know this to be true. Now, research also shows, and this is Deloitte research, that 91% of leaders believe that their employees know that they care about their well-being. However, that same research tells us that only 53% of employees agree. So there's a, there's a disconnect, right? Now, I don't think this disconnect is down to leaders being terrible people, of course. Um, but it does speak to the fact that leaders are either willingly or unwillingly sacrificing well-being to pursue results. Because, as I said earlier, some of us might believe these things to be mutually exclusive endeavors. So given that, based on what you have both shared already, given that this is perhaps flawed thinking as well-being is clearly integral to high performance, Katie, how can leaders help to better create cultures that elevate the well-being of their employees? Mm -hmm. And I would say bearing in mind the tough market and the challenges that leaders face. So again, it's not easy, but we know that leaders play such an important role. So how can leaders help to create more mentally healthy cultures for their employees? I think, um, well, first of all, I think you've highlighted such an important issue regarding the disconnect, right, between the leaders' perceptions of caring for employees' well-being and the actual experiences. So it is true that leaders often face that challenge in balancing this pursuit of results and employee well-being. And I would also like to say that it's not just down to the leaders, of course, and we can get back to this, but there are several strategies that leaders can adopt to better create cultures that elevate employee well-being, even in the face of tough market conditions, like you said, and challenges. Um, and I think it starts with leading by, by example. I think Simone touched on that a little bit earlier on as well. Actively demonstrating their commitment to well-being by taking care of their own well-being and openly discussing its importance. Modeling behaviors such as work-life balance, self-care, stress management, leaders can really influence their teams to prioritize well-being that way as well. And it's about fostering open communication, you know, encouraging open and honest communications within the organizations. Leaders can really create a safe and supportive environment that way. And then employees feel more comfortable expressing their well-being concerns or seeking help or providing feedback. Um, and I, I think this element of active listening to employees' perspectives as well, you know, that addressing their concerns, taking appropriate actions to improve well-being, those are really, really relevant points. And then, I guess, introducing and supporting the well-being initiatives that align with the organization values as well and the organizational culture, that's very important. And, you know, I guess, depending on the cult, the organization, I suppose, looking at developing a supportive organizational structure, um, such as fair workload distribution, you know, clear expectations, opportunities for growth and development. Those are really motivating things, you know. Uh, we love to achieve things and accomplish things as human beings. So providing the resources and tools um, to manage work effectively and fostering collaboration. These things are really, really important. And um, I guess also, and you probably won't be surprised me mentioning this again about job craft. We've spoken about this before, loads empowering employees, you know, by encouraging their autonomy and involvement and in decision making as well. Um, so, you know, when it, when it comes to their job roles, those things are very relevant and there's backed by a lot of research. Of course, the element of training and education as well. Um, training and educating leaders about mental health, you know, equipping them actually with the knowledge and the skills that they need to identify if somebody in their team is being more stressed um, and, you know, having those then more effective conversations as a result of that. And of course, measuring as well. I think Simone mentioned that before as well. Um, so I think, yeah, adopting these different approaches, they leaders can really bridge the gap between their perceptions and also employees' experiences regarding caring for well-being. And it require it really requires a shift in mindset, I think, um, recognizing that you know the employee well-being is not a trade-off, but rather the catalyst for high performance, really, and productivity and the organizational success. So uh, yeah, leaders will prioritize this, they will create um, and culture that kind of fosters the engagement and loyalty and resilience of the employees. So you mentioned 
So Simone, you, I, I can see you have something to add. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think what really resonated, Katie, you, you mentioned a lot of things that really resonated with me. I also, I also want to add to that. I think that there's a level of vulnerability that leaders need to have um, that I think a lot of times it can feel uncomfortable for leaders to have, whether it's even about their own mental health. Um, journeys that they're having or well-being journeys that they're having. Obviously, it's very personal. Um, and so I think that, again, kind of going back to what we've been talking about in terms of role modeling and making sure that um, they are modeling these behaviors, I also think that there is something special about a leader who comes and says, hey, I've, I've been struggling with this, or here's how I've effectively put boundaries in place um, that could really be integral to helping to maintain and create a culture of well-being at organizations. I think it's so important. I think what you both mentioned here is, is, is human leadership, right? And if we look at the types of leadership that have been shown to be more supportive of not only well-being, but performance stuff like transformational leadership and servant leadership, the, the commonality is it's, it's human-centered leadership. So I think that's really important. And I think the reason why it's important is that, come back to that analogy of an organization not being a machine, but instead being an ecosystem made up of human beings, those human beings have very real universal psychological human needs that if met, help them to, to show up as their best selves and perform, but if not met, the opposite, right? And those needs are things like autonomy and a sense of belonging and fairness and trust and safety, very intrinsic human needs. And of all the factors within an organization that can either meet those needs or not, we know that leaders have a real outsized influence. Um, and so it's important that leaders at least just keep this in mind. It can then inform how they show up. However, this is, this is challenging stuff, right? It's challenging stuff. Leaders have very challenging roles. There's so many competing demands. And so the well-being of leaders is also supremely important. Leaders are there to support people. But it's very difficult to support people effectively. It's very difficult to be em em empathetic. It's difficult to be compassionate. It's difficult to pay attention if you yourself are feeling burnt out and unhealthy. So Prioritizing your own well-being is also a really important thing for leaders to do in my mind. It helps you then show up for others in the way that best meet others' needs. So yeah, really, really important. But Simone, so like we've said, you know, there are probably a lot of leaders that have these intentions when it comes to supporting the well-being of their people. But like we've just said, it's tough. So based on your experience or things that you've noticed, what are some of the most common pitfalls that leaders encounter? when trying to support employee well-being or when trying to implement well-being initiatives in their organizations? You know, Steve, I have seen this both um, during my time here at Coltramp as well as my time prior to Coltramp when I was an HR practitioner. I think that some of the common pitfalls that um, I've seen leaders uh, unfortunately fall, fall prey to um, are things that we've already mentioned. Um, but just want to reiterate them because I think that they are so critical to making sure that well-being is an integral part of the employee experience at organizations. Um, so one of those common pitfalls is making sure that uh, leaders feel comfortable tackling this, this topic. It can be a bit overwhelming. Um, I know that before coming to culture, I'm talking about my own personal well-being with my manager or my, my people leader wasn't something I was always equipped to do. Um, and that's me as an employee. And I can only imagine how that is for leaders on the opposite end of that, of like, how do I even approach, you know, Simone, Steve, or Katie about, you know, how the how they're doing from a well-being perspective? Um, this can be remedied, of course, by surveying um, or even embedding these uh, things more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So, like thinking about how you can talk about this in your one-on-ones with your employees. At Coltramp, we actually have in our one-on-one -on -one module a sliding scale that helps employees to rate how they're doing uh, from a well-being perspective, um, which provides an extra layer of protection, I think, for both the employee and the manager to bring it up and say, hey, like I noticed that you know last week you were really high on well-being, this week you're a little bit lower. Talk to me about where you're feeling stretched thin. How can I support you? So really enabling the leader to have that conversation and also to putting it in a safe space where employees do feel okay with providing that information. So that's one that's one pitfall that I, I've seen and, and also a remedy. I think the other pitfall that I see, and again, this is something that we've been uh, talking about is this idea of modeling well-being behaviors or talking about their own well-being. 
Obviously, leaders like this will, again, come back to some level of vulnerability in doing this, but employees uh, look up to leaders. Um, we know that p employees will look up to our leaders in terms of role modeling behavior and things of that nature. So if a leader is taking time to exercise or recharge via PTO um, and not answering emails at night, for example, or after a certain hour, it sets the tone for employees um, to know that it's okay if they do the same. Um, so I would encourage leaders to be very mindful of the messages that they're sending. Don't just say, hey, log off at five, don't answer your email, and then start sending your employees emails at 630. That doesn't signal that, that, that signals two different things to employees, like a few different things, and could often cause confusion. This is definitely, just, these are definitely just a few different uh, pitfalls that I've seen, um, but by enabling your uh, culture to be more well-being focused, um, it definitely can help leaders and employees to uh, feel better about this. That's, yeah, that's that's really important. <clears throat> I think this doesn't exclude, you know, learning and, and training at a, at a leadership level as well. Like sometimes just learning how to have these conversations um, can be can make a major difference, right? Because it, what might be holding people back is just not feeling confident to be able to have these conversations. So I think that's really important. Now, so we've been talking about leaders and, and because leaders play a really important role, but for Katie, it's not just about leaders. So, you know, as, as I said earlier, we all have a role to play when it comes to creating workplace cultures that elevate well-being. So tell us what steps you think all employees could be taking to better support their own mental health and well-being at work and also that of their colleagues? Um, I, I think creating a mentally healthy workplace culture is a collective effort and it involves everybody. So, you know, from the organizational level, we always talk about it, right? The, the, there's a whole organization approach. So some steps that all employees can take is prioritizing their own self-care. I always have to come back to that. It starts within ourselves. So taking responsibility for our own well-being by practicing self-care strategies. And sometimes that goes back to just pure basics, right, of what you eat, having enough sleep, exercising, um, having stress management tools. And there's fantastic tools on our mind as well that we offer people with those things just to switch off. Um establishing healthy boundaries between work and personal life promoting that work-life balance as well you know there is this importance of not just working 24 7 you know we have to regenerate and and recharge you know that we can't just run on nothing so um also about fostering positive relationships of course from a positive psychology is this point of view are, are very much you know relationships are so crucial so building positive and supportive relationship with our colleagues offering listening ears to each other showing empathy you know the willingness to help each other engaging in kind of respectful constructive communication valuing diversity promoting inclusivity in the workplace all of those things are really things that we can do at an eye level so it is also about educating ourselves of course about mental health and you know whilst being mindful of our own mental well-being so looking out for signs maybe of stress or burnout other mental health challenges within ourselves or also our colleagues you know and offering support being okay to seeking support ourselves um so I guess yeah take an active role really in creating this positive environment within ourselves but also with our colleagues that will really be helping and I think someone said that earlier as well about well-being champions you know encouraging those implementations um, in the organizations that be really really good we need to remember that supporting our own mental health and the well-being is not only important you know for our personal growth but also it contributes to a healthier more productive uh, work and personal environment so we need to actively engage in these steps and support our colleagues and 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 ourselves really i think i uh katie i really like what you said about well-being champions i think it's such a I won't say easy lift because I don't think that there's really truthfully a lot of things that are easy about well-being in certain respects, but I do think it's something that it's an active step that one employees can take, but also to that uh, organizations can help enable employees to do. Um, I was looking when I was preparing for this call on, on Unmind's website, and you all have a really great resource about how to create well-being champions within organizations, what actually a well-being champion is. And I found it to be super helpful and just some insights that I was like, oh, this is really, this is really a great resource for people to to look into. Um, so I just wanted to add that in um, to, to the conversation. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that, thanks for sharing that, Simone. Um, <clears throat> I think, yes, our team's just put a link to that. We've got a Wellbeing Champions Hub. I'm really proud of us, actually, in terms of what our team's created. It's, it's, it's an amazing resource and, and learning development sort of hub for Wellbeing Champions within any organization. We, as an organization, are giving it away for free. So do click the link and, and check that out. I think Wellbeing Champions have such an important part to play in the organization. I often describe them as, you know, the eyes, the ears, and, you know, the heart of well-being within that organization. Um, and they're often sort of the, the link between, let's say, the well-being strategy team and the rest of the organization. So they can really bring high-quality feedback and ideas um, from there to there. And I've, I found them supremely valuable at Unmind. So that was all really important. What stood out for me is that it's 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 the same essential needs and factors that would apply to leaders, right? But it's, I guess this is about asking ourselves, what is my sphere of influence and how can I exercise that in a way that, you know, best supports my team, the people around me, my organization when it comes to mental health and well-being. And that be, might be different from person to person, but really, you know, it's, it's, it's the basics like care and compassion and kindness and, and you know, supporting one another and, and, and all the rest. So, yeah, I think really, really important mm -hmm. stuff. So both Katie and Simone, I'd love you to, before we go to the q and I'd love you to both project forward and imagine a future five to 10 years from now where we've really got all the stuff that we've been talking about. We've got this right. And we have managed to co-create workplaces that help all employees flourish at work, or at least give every employee the opportunity to flourish at work, which effectively is a workplace that enhances both people's well-being and their performance. So descri describe what this looks and feels like to be working in such an organization in the future. Um, perhaps Simone, we'll start with you. Sure. I, I really like this question. Um, I tend to think futuristically anyway, so I'm always like in the future, I'm not, I'm working on being more present personally. Um, but in the future, I think that um, organizations that are really getting this right and you know, we're not having some of the issues that we're having. Employees are able to bring their whole selves to work in terms of well-being. So organizations are integrating well-being into their culture, which enables employees to be more open about what they're experiencing. Um, and it's at the forefront of conversations. Um, and so organizations are then able to assist employees um, with whatever they may be dealing with, whether that's getting in EAP programs or whether you're having partnerships for uh, meditation or yoga, things of that nature, um, or even just managing work, right? I, I know we talked about crafting job roles and, and things of that nature. So I think that it's more employee focused. I think that it's more employees feeling comfortable bringing themselves to work in that way and talking about things and really removing the stigma. Um, I think that is associated so much with talking about well-being in the workplace. That's kind of my prediction um, for five to 10 years in the future. Well, I love that. I'm sure it sounds like a place that most slash all people would want to work at. Um, Katie, your, your vision? Uh, yeah, I, I jump right right on that bandwagon there with Simone. I think um, really that kind of positive and supportive culture uh, built on the foundation of trust, you know, respect and empathy. I think where colleagues and also leaders just genuinely care and we kind of move a little bit away from this whole managing people, but caring also for each other because <laughs> we are human beings after all. Um, so I think, you know, that those are really important points um, that uh, you already kind of elaborated earlier on as well, but also things like meaningful and purposeful work. So making sure employees would have clear understanding of how their work contributes to the organizational mission and purpose. Um, and I think the continuous learning and growth is so, so important. So organizations would prioritize probably ongoing learning and development, providing loads of opportunities for employees to kind of enhance their skills, their strengths, their knowledge and career progressions as well. Um, and, you know, the kind of healthy and constructive relationship among team members, all of that. So where we, where we can really kind of, we talk a lot about diversity and inclusivity, but we really need to embrace it, you know, on a, on a human level again. And uh, I think those things are really, really important. And I honestly don't think, and I guess uh, my psychology title kind of hides behind it, but I, I don't think that saying 
feeling fulfilled would be an exaggeration, given that we spend such a significant amount of time working. So in a future where workplaces have successfully prioritized well-being and created this safe environment that fosters both flourishing and also high performance, working in such organizations will be so motivating, energizing. It will probably, yeah, probably make people feel quite fulfilled. You know, they would feel, would have a sense of belonging and purpose and personal growth. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. um, the results will be um, that a workforce, workforce like this is not only highly productive overall, but also happy and engaged and yeah, flourishing, really truly flourishing. Yeah, I would hope that we don't see these as overly idealistic, because I don't think they are. Like the workplace has all the potential factors to support human flourishing. You know, you the, the factors that we spoke about earlier, those, those human needs, like feeling like you matter, that you belong, that you are um, adding a valuable contribution to your community, et cetera. Like the workplace can be conducive of all of these. And the, the thing is, if we get that right, employees flourish, they perform better. It's the whole like people up, business up thing. So like it's a win-win situation. Um, and I just think it's limiting beliefs that are holding us back from that. <clears throat> so thanks for sharing those visions. I want to move over to some of the questions that have been added by our audience. So thanks so much for sending these through. We may not get to all of them, but I'm de definitely going to try and get to a few of them. So I'm going to ask the questions and Katie and Simone, feel free to whoever feels like answering or if you both want to answer, that is, that is all good. So first question, how much does realistic workload impact employee well-being? Are there any trends and tools for ensuring employees have reasonable workloads? And that's a question from Susan. So Simone or Katie, any, any thoughts on that? What relationship does realistic workload play when it comes to employee well-being? And are there any ways of ensuring employees have reasonable workloads? Um, I think um, at all three levels, at organizational levels, uh, there needs to be they, it needs to be made sure that the resources are there, right? So all whether technology or platforms that, that enable people to kind of do what they need to do. And then I guess at manager level, you want to make sure that there is clarity on their job role and the expectations. Are they in line with the mission of the organization? How can they, you know, in some of the points we talked about earlier as well, um, and then I guess it goes back to uh, leading by example as well, right? So making sure that we prioritize, I always like to use the analogy of prioritizing our um, porcelain plates over the plastic plates. So which plastic plates can you drop temporarily and mm. which you know porcelain plates do you have to carry on holding up? So yeah, I guess um, that kind of, yeah, being a bit more, realistic from all levels, I think would really enable a healthier environment. Katie, I definitely agree with you. I would, I always encourage my uh, customers, especially those who have gone through um, times of uncertainty. So things like layoffs, for example, you don't, and this is like just a general rule of thumb, I think that I also give as well is that you don't want to do um, more with less. So like, you want to make sure that you are enabling you want to make sure that your employees know what the priorities are, know where they need to be putting their efforts, and really making that crystal clear. You can't have 10 priorities. Like it, it shouldn't be that much if you only have how many ever employees, because then that's going to make obviously their workload, it's going to impact their work, their workload, which will then trickle into their well-being. Um, I think that uh, from a tools perspective, in order to again monitor whether workloads are reasonable, we have an item within our culture and template that specifically asks, you know, my workload is reasonable to my role or something along those lines. So you can always use uh, surveying and also checking in during one-on-ones to see where things are at, um, how you can assist your employees to manage and prioritize what things are most important to getting work done. So Susan, I hope that that helps. Thank you, Simone. So this is a, a big question, an important question. Um, especially for maybe people with an HR and in terms of how the conversations that they might be having with senior leaders in the organization. The question here from Teresa is, how can you prove what the ROI is in regard to employee well-being when there are several contributory factors in employee productivity and engagement? 
a big tough question. Anyone feel like they can answer it? So again, I I don't want to keep sounding like a broken record, but again, this is where getting good data and making sure that yeah. you are collecting that employee data is super important. So understanding the your employee uh, experience, so everything from why employees are even attracted to your organization, what their experience is when they're kind of in the thick of your organization, and then why they're exiting your organization, and then tying that back to metrics around productivity, loss uh, losses, and things of that nature, I think will really help to tell that story in terms of what actually is happening from employee well-being perspective and whether that's something that may be driving attrition within your organization or could be helping if your organization is getting right to help increase um, profits and productivity. Thank you, Simone. So I've got a few questions. I'm just trying to pick them out. Um, again, I'm, maybe I'm throwing some of the challenging questions here, but how can you assist leaders and employees in unlearning the time is money mentality so that having a better work-life balance doesn't come with guilt. So this, sounds, this is a very like, systemic question. The final part of the question is organizational culture can be a strong barrier to change. I guess the question is how can we, how can we change organizational cultures, but how can we assist leaders in unlearning the time is money mentality so that having a better work-life balance doesn't come with guilt? Do either of you have any thoughts and perspectives on this? I would say using exactly the same power there because the power is in the words here and the language. So it's about the communication around it, changing our ways of talking about things, being busy, time is money, all of these phrases that have such a big impact on our mind and on our psychology. I think it's so, so important to just change, starting with changing the language within an organization. And that obviously comes through education and awareness. Um, also through role modeling at higher levels so it can be like a top-down approach you know where people really like see how it's done how the walk um, how the talk is being walked and they can kind of follow so um, and redefining maybe success metrics as well as at organizational levels so you know I don't know there's so, so many different things like I think but especially besides establishing healthy boundaries as well and you know, flexible work arrangements, all of these different things that we talk about, I think it really comes back to open communication, changing our language around things and really creating a culture of um, open, but also better communication around these things. I, I definitely, some a lot of things that you said um, really resonated with me, Katie. And also I think that uh, this is an opportunity maybe even to lean in. And I think you kind of mentioned this to the time is money mentality, kind of going back to the ROI conversation or the question that we had before. So there's some leaders that are going to be really moved and motivated by the money perspective of this. And so kind of leaning into that and, and using that. I will also say that I think that um, holding holding your employees accountable. So we know that organizational culture or organizational culture takes time to change. In order to change that, you have to set the tone from the top and have accountability metrics um, or accountability mechanisms in place to make sure that people are changing. It's going to take time, but without actually having accountability, um, whether that's, you know, leaders checking in um, and saying like, hey, like your well-being scores, this, this go around, we're pretty low. What's been going on? What have you as a leader been, have you been doing? Have you been talking about the resources that we have? So really using that accountability and behaviors um, to help morph the organization is something that I would, I would definitely focus in on. Okay. Thank you both. I have a question from Casey. What advice do you have for working with an employee that is very private about their personal mental health and well-being? So how can you get an idea of how best to support without encroaching on their boundaries? I think it's a, it's a good question. Does anyone like to go first? Oh, yeah, that's a <laughs> kind of kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about individual differences, right? It's so I mean, human beings, we're all different. And I guess uh, I would just take it back to creating that safe and supportive environment within teams, within the relationship between the managers and, and, and the employees, but also within teams, fostering that culture of psychological safety where employees feel comfortable discussing certain things and kind of supporting the normalization of that as well without judgment or negative consequences when they do do so. So basically engaging that positive reinforcement um, but also I think maybe providing sometimes it's that thinking of um, also what's in it for me so maybe 
the the providing the general resources and support like to to really um, change the communications within organizations will actually how they will benefit from it as well and I guess if it's not really it doesn't come natural and a lot of people think when they think about mental health and well-being and work or vulnerability like someone said earlier a lot of people think well I don't want to you know I don't want to talk about emotions at work and they really just narrow it down to that so I think it's again really comes back to our narratives and communication around these topics breaking down some of the stigmas and just changing the narrative around those things and I think it also again starts with training managers and leaders uh, so they are equipped in those situations to really guide the, their teams yeah I also think too that this could be a really great opportunity I know we talked about this a little bit already in um, some our, a little bit earlier in our conversation this is a great opportunity again for well-being champions and like not even like you don't have to be a form like a formal well-being champion just even thinking about the culture of well-being at your organization making sure that your employees know where their resources are um and uh what is available to them and you know if there is a point of escalation where do they go for that and like how do they work that because i may be talking with somebody to uh case's point uh who is more private about what they're dealing with and while i might not be a fo a formal well-being champion, I still do have a responsibility as an employee of an organization to point my colleague or my mentor, my manager in the right direction of, hey, you said that you were kind of struggling with this. You've seemed a little off. Here's some resources that I think could be helpful. And again, kind of, Katie, going back to your point around building that, that piece of vulnerability um, in a psychologically safe organization, those are the core tenants and making sure that your employees um, who are on the front lines with their colleagues will feel most comfortable doing that. Thank you both. You've, you've probably answered this to a large degree, but just in case you have any further ideas to answer one final question from the audience here, which, which is a good follow on from what you've just said. You've been talking about psychological safety. Um, I think what this person is anonymous question, what this person is, is looking for is actual tangible things that employees or well-being chairmans can actually do to support or help to create a psychologically safe environment are there any just a few things that come to mind that you can share yeah absolutely i i would go back to like almost emotional intelligence right so like the part of active listening and validation you know um encouraging speaking up um, you know having a voice giving constructive feedback um, employees can really promote also collaboration and teamwork by fostering a spirit of cooperation, sharing knowledge, really in, that kind of inclusive environment is really, really important. And then also, again, to the point of well-being champions, I guess, um, having those more neutral people maybe involved as well that, you know, c completely change the culture of an organization. So, um, yeah, that really, I think, helps facilitating that conversation. So I think it's about, yeah, tuning into how you actually communicate as well with, with people and having that very honest, open communications and not judging people when they have the two, you know, so that that fear of they feel safe, basically, judging, contributing, sorry, not judging, <laughs> contributing, uh, contributing to things. And yeah, that kind of creates it. I, I think also, too, it goes back to... Um, educating yourself as an employee um, and making sure that you're using the proper language and that again let you are uh, thinking about what resources your organization has so really connecting the dots but for me I think it goes back to more of that education piece and more introspective about what's your journey with well-being because once you become more comfortable with that I think it lends to you being a more authentic version of yourself which can then play a role in you supporting a more psychologically safe environment yeah yeah, I think the more open and vulnerable we are, the more we invite others to be the same or feel safe to be. Okay, so we've covered a lot of great stuff that I know people will be able to work with, but I would like to finish with just a, a final recommendation or recommendations for people who, who want to leave with something tangible that they can action straight away. So would you mind both sharing one, two, three recommendations each? Um, if you're going to go for three, perhaps one for leaders, one for managers, one for employees, I don't want to be too prescriptive. So just what are your recommendations that people can take away with them to help them elevate well-being at work? So Katie, I'll start with you. <laughs> uh, I'm always really bad. It's like me in a candy shop when it comes to these things. Um, 
But I, I guess um, to just to reiterate a lot of uh, what we said and the importance of also the research that kind of supporting all of these things is, uh, I think, for leaders, I would say definitely focusing on fostering a psycho psychosocial sa safety at work, a, a culture um, that supports well-being, that kind of has this culture of you know empathy and respect and inclusion and really integrates these really important elements um and also on the flip side it's easier to start by eliminating psychosocial hazards as much as possible right so um i think at an organization level, you have to have those things making sure the resources are there for the demands that we have and and it all starts really with psychological safety um so sorry psychosocial safety um and for managers i guess I know we said that a lot, but I just I always go back to the happy parent, happy child analogy in a way. So I feel like it really is about leading by example and, and you know, fostering positive relationships within your teams and demonstrating empathy, active listening, providing the support. So it's it's almost it becomes it becomes the norm and becomes the culture. And um, yeah, I guess for employees feeling okay and not guilty about prioritizing self-care and, and taking responsibility for your own well-being um, and uh, advocating for well-being so you know become well-being champion if you like uh, which also it requires a lot of self-care and also you know being able to kind of rejuvenate yourself and refuel um, yeah but I think by implementing a lot of the things that we talked about and uh, some of the other recommendations that everybody can contribute and it's not just the one one person job so it is about creating something together uh, as a workforce um, that kind of prioritizes well-being and then fosters engagement and promotes the overall flourishing of, of the company thank you and Kate. You. Simone. <laughs> i would say for leaders as well as managers i mean and obviously there are different levels but i think that this is a great opportunity for you to regularly check on all your employees well-being um, understand what support you can provide within the ramifications of your organization. Um, additionally, I think that there are ways in which both populations, both managers and leaders can model um, well-being uh, well behaviors to help um, preserve employee well-being and to uh, foster it. And then finally, for employees, um, Katie, I really like what you mentioned about going on your own journey. I would also say that this is an employee's opportunity to become an agent of change within their own organization. And this can be in both formal and informal ways to which we have already mentioned before. In a formal way, would obviously becoming a true well-being champion um, and or informally just making sure that you are actively listening and educating yourself on how to talk about well-being within the guides of your organization. I love that. I love the, the term agents of change. I think if we can all take that on board, we can help to create healthier workplace cultures. So thank you, Dr. Katie. Thank you, Simone. I've loved hearing your thoughts. Uh, you've shared some really actionable advice on this important topic. And I think the message is clear that well-being and high performance are not mutually exclusive. Employee well-being is an essential ingredient in, in being a high-performing individual, a team or an organization. And with the right intention, the right strategy, you and you know we can create workplace cultures and environments where both the employee and the business can flourish so i hope that all of you on the call today walk away from this webinar with at least one thing that you know you want to try in your own workplace i want to thank you all for sharing your thoughts in the chat it's been it's been great to have you with us today so thank you for joining us um i hope you all have a good rest of your week and we will see you at the next event thank you everyone. thank you bye